welcome everybody. My name is Mike Jesh. I am a, uh, by night I'm a 787 captain. By day I fly a 182 based out of Fullerton Airport. I'm an active flight instructor, been an instructor for almost 40 years now. It scares me to think of that. And one of the things I've always loved, I'm not much of a gray matter, squishy brain kind of instructor. I like the technical in the weeds, the nuts and bolts. Most of what I do is IFR instruction. Uh, and if you've seen any of those Garmin things, the, the GPS navigators, that's right in my wheelhouse. I love it. But a few years ago, somebody said, hey, can you tell me something about the airspeed indicator? So I came up with this talk. Oh, hello, my name is Airspeed. Uh, how many of you think you know everything you need to know about the airspeed indicator? Hey, right, we got one guy. All right, awesome. Two, oh, a tentative one and a half back there. So a little bit about me, yeah, that's my 787 over there, and that pays the bills for my 182, which is over on the North 40 over here. I've flown it to Oshkosh about a, maybe 10 or a dozen times or so now, and it's a great traveling machine. I've had it for about 15, 16 years, and uh, that airspeed indicator in the last picture was my airspeed indicator. So how am I going to talk about the airspeed indicator for, half, for, for an hour, right? And actually, I had to take a chainsaw and a maul to this thing because it, it's, I easily go an hour and a quarter. I could go an hour and a half on the airspeed indicator. So here's a few things we're going to talk about. Um, I'll show you some pictures of a range of airspeed indicators. We'll talk about why we have one, how do they work, what kinds of airspeed. Uh, we'll review a couple of V-speeds and some ways that it fails and gets people into trouble. Um, and we all know Bill Kirshner had this saying here, losing out the airspeed. Let's the ground rise up and smite thee. And it's one of those things we always talk about. You get in an airplane, and you push far forward, and the houses get bigger, right? You pull back, and the houses get smaller. And if you keep pulling back, they get bigger again, just like as if you had pushed down. So we all know the six-pack is where everything is, and the airspeed on a regular round dial panel. The airspeed indicator lives in that upper right corner on the standardized panel now. And if you flew an airplane back in the 50s and 60s, who knows where it was going to hide out? But nowadays... They're uh, centered over there. And um, this is the guy that, who invented it. He was a British pilot. He was the ninth British pilot in England. He bought a Wright Flyer from the Wright brothers, went back to England, taught himself how to fly. And after a little while, he took a, a, a device that had been used in rivers, invented by Henri Pitot, the Pitot tube, to determine water flow in a river. And he adapted it to airflow to measure airspeed. So this is the guy. Uh, he conjured this thing up in about 1912, and let's see, he was, uh, yeah, he went on to, to work for the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, a whole bunch of other things. He was a well-known, respected engineer in England. That's an airspeed indicator, probably off a hang glider. And what I love about this is, uh, let me get the other, here's what I want. This little red thing there, that's your indicator, and it's real easy to see that it's quite simple. You put pedo pressure in the bottom here, the, the top of it, is open to the atmosphere. So essentially, that's your static pressure at the top, your pitot pressure at the bottom. It pushes the thing up, and there's your airspeed indicator. Simple, right? One moving part. Probably doesn't need any lube. Who knows you know, how long it's going to last. Uh, so we start getting a little bit more complicated. This one is, uh, you see, I don't have the notes here on what this is off of, but I've actually seen an airplane that has this mounted. It's a, a, a strutted biplane. It's mounted over on the right wing. And this one works uh, with the air pressure against a spring, not static pressure. So I thought, well, this is kind of weird, you know. If that spring gets a little rusted, I'll bet it's an incorrect explanation on there or, or display. So we start. Brian, you keep stealing my focus. That's the one problem of this kind here. There we go. So uh, this one, uh, it, if you could see it very clearly, it's kind of dark over here. It only goes up to about 30 miles an hour. Uh, one of the first times I gave this presentation, a guy Googled this image and said he found it on a bicycle instrumentation site. So I don't know if it was ever used on bicycles, but it looks a little like a Rogallo wing type hang glider at the bottom of that. So I, th I suspect that's where that came from. Now we start getting a little bit more normal here. This one's at least it's a round dial and it's got numbers on it. We're all used to that. There's a weird one. This one's, uh, I believe, off of a glider of some sort. And so, you know, if, if it was going to point over in this direction, you might need to know if it was 30 or 130. That might be good to know. Um, and I don't know exactly where I'm told. I'm not familiar with this, but I believe the yellow triangle is a 
minimum speed with ballast or a maximum speed with ballast? I'm not glider certified, so somebody maybe more qualified than me can talk about that. Anybody know what kind of airplane this one comes off of? No multi-engine pilots in the room? You got the red radial, the blue radial. The red radial on a multi-engine airplane is your VMCA, or minimum controllable airspeed in the air, as opposed to a ground speed. The yellow is your best rate of climb airspeed with one engine. Or, I'm sorry, the blue is best rate of climb on one engine. So if you're a multi-engine pilot, that's really important to know. Uh, and you won't see those on a single engine airplane. And most of what we're going to talk about today is going to be single engine airplanes. Here's one, I believe it's off of a Bonanza. And on this one, you've got the little scale down here. This one's a true airspeed computer. So in addition to showing you the indicated airspeed, you can put your temperature across your altitude up here, and then the computer at the bottom will show you what the true airspeed is. We're going to get into that just a little bit more in a little bit. Uh, this one's a little blurry, uh, but I took this picture. Anybody want to make a guess about what kind of airplane this came off of? Cessna 150 over here? No. Would you believe it? That is Glamorous Glenis, the first airplane that went Mach 1. So that thing spins around a bunch of times, and this little window up here goes up. You can see it's under 100 right now. That rolls over as it goes faster and faster. So I thought that was kind of interesting. How about this one? Yeah, you know that one. Brian and I have both flown this one. I believe it's a, 780, a 767, maybe a 757. Uh, this one, we add a Mach indicator at the top. Uh, we've got a, a knots in, in numbers down here at the bottom. I think you need a driver update on this, this pointer thing. Um, you notice this doesn't have any colors on it, though, like you're used to seeing in your, your single-engine piston-powered airplanes, because the numbers are all different based on weight. So what we do in the jets on this particular airplane, we take these bugs over here, and we adjust these bugs for the gross weight of the airplane, and that tells us what speeds we can deploy flaps at, at various weights. So I took this picture also. I flew the 737-800 for about 20 years, and this is our primary flight display that includes airspeed over here. I can tell that my co-pilot was flying because he's off by 60 feet of altitude. <laughs> His altimeter is right on, but mine's allowed to be 75 feet difference, and I'm at 50, so it's all good. Anybody got a GI-275 in your airplane? Yeah, kind of nice. I'm thinking about putting a pair of these in, in my 182 also. Same sort of deal. We got the airspeed over here on the left. And one of the things I really like about these digital electronic airspeed displays is you can put different things on it. So this one's got your, your white arc down here. Yeah, I wonder if I'm just too far away from that thing. Um, but you notice over on the left side of it here, it's got the VLE display, your, your uh, landing gear extended speed. So that's kind of nice. Uh, you don't see that on a regular analog steam-powered airspeed indicator. Uh, it's also got a whole bunch of other things that are beyond the scope of what we'll talk about here today. Uh, uh, this is a G5. Similar sort of display. You're starting to see some commonality. Airspeed's on the left, altimeter's on the right. Uh, you'll have vertical speed over there on the right as well. Uh, all sorts of other stuff, again, beyond the scope. You know, we're down to where the airspeed is just this little portion over there on the left side of the, the display. Ah, OK, here we are, back to normal. This is what you, you're used to seeing in a 152. You feeling a little bit more comfortable now? Got your white arcs, your green arcs, all your, all your colors there. So why do we have an airspeed indicator in the airplane? And the, the first thing is because the, the rule says to. This is what part 91 says you have to have installed in your airplane. And you see the very first thing on the list is airspeed indicator. That's why you got to have one. Anybody ever flown an airplane without an airspeed indicator? I think the statute of limitations is over on my experience. That's another story. It, right. Not for long after, but yeah. Also, I had a partial engine failure on that one. It was really exciting. This is the rule that the manufacturers follow when they build your airplane. So we got to have one in it to operate it. When the manufacturer builds your airplane, that's what tells them you got to have it. And notice it's at the top of the list. So it must be pretty important if it's on the very first thing on two different menus we're looking at. So yeah, and then this is the reg that talks about how accurate it needs to be. And we're going to go through each of those little you know, sections, put you right to sleep. So how many of you think the airspeed indicator needs to be inspected? We all talk about a biennial 
pedostatic inspection, right? They're not actually testing your pedo system very much. They just want to make sure there's not a leak in it. But they never test your airspeed indicator for accuracy. The only requirement is that your altimeter is accurate. And the reason they hook them both up is because these pressure differences that you'll see in a moment, what kind of pressure differences we're talking about, are very small. And if they ran your static pressure up to altitude without running your pedo pressure with it, you would destroy the airspeed indicator. So that's why we hook them both up. Um, every two years, you've got to have it done. Got a static pressure, altimeter instrument, and pressure altitude reporting system. Uh, there's another one that talks about your transponder, but airspeed indicator is not in that list. So they're actually, I call it a static transponder inspection, not a, not a, a pedostatic inspection. But everybody knows what that is, so that's how we do it. So how's it work? There's a little man inside there who's looking at two little dials, and he's twisting a knob, and that, no, it, um, it's basically a, just a differential pressure gauge. We'll take a look at a picture in a minute, but we're comparing the pressure outside the airplane with the, the pressure that's generated by the motion of the airplane through the atmosphere. And uh, I always wondered why they called it Q. If you ever watched the space shuttle launches back in the 80s and 90s, you'd hear them make the call up to the shuttle during the launch. They would say, Max Q. That's the highest dynamic pressure they get to. And they're using that same letter Q that's what the, all the engineers use to talk about this difference. So it's a difference between the static and the ram pressure. Um, and then I got to thinking, well, how much difference are we talking about? And it turns out it's really small. You know, if you're at 100 knots, you're less than a quarter of a PSI. And Brian, this thing's it, still not working here. I lost my pointer. That was a great idea to use this. Oh. Yay, I found it. Thank you. The co-pilot's got my back. So if you're doing 80 knots, we're talking about 0.15 PSI. Very, very small number. You don't even get up to one PSI until you're at the bottom here, over 200 knots. So the point I want to make here is this instrument is very delicate. If you're looking at that pedo tube and you think you've got some schmutz or bugs or something crawling around in there, don't blow it out. If you blow into that pedo tube, you can easily generate a pressure that's high enough to damage your instrument. So don't do that. Find a mechanic. And what they'll typically do is they'll disconnect the pedo line and blow out through the tube, not involve the instruments in this process. So back to how does it work again uh, think about this for a moment can you if i give you a piece of paper and a pen could you draw a picture of the pedostatic system for your airplane when's the last time you did this maybe your instrument check ride maybe uh, but if you draw that you're going to end up with something that looks maybe a little bit like this you got your altimeter you know what happens i think it keeps moving over there there it is altimeter vertical speed and airspeed, your static lines, maybe you fly an airplane that has a static port on either side of the cockpit, uh, maybe you fly an airplane that has an alternate static valve inside the cockpit that goes to somewhere else, but your pedo pressure is all completely separate, not connected to the other instruments at all, your altimeter and your vertical speed. Uh, if you fly an airplane that's certified for IFR, your pedo tube will have a heater in it so that you can keep the ice off it. And there's a picture of the, the pedo tube on my 182. This is one of the static ports. We've seen this a, a million times, right? So here's a little bit more of a diagram. You, get, you see your static source is vented to the main part of the, the case here. And then you got your pedo pressure comes into an aneroid in here. That aneroid is connected to the knee bone and connected to the leg bone. And you end up with a little gadget like this. As that aneroid blows up, it moves the needle on the indicator. Pretty simple. Here's a picture of one. This came from my friend Steve Ells, who's an ANP, takes great pictures of everything he sees in an airplane. And this was the best photograph I've ever seen of what that aneroid system looks like. And it's connected through various linkages up to your airspeed indicator. So when you're thinking about airspeed, we have a lot of different kinds of airspeed we deal with in airplanes. Uh, they come in this order. And we'll go through each of these a little bit. So if you remember Ice-T, that's a clever way to, to remember this, uh, the order of, of play here. So the first one we're going to talk about is indicated. Who wants to venture a guess about what indicated airspeed means? 
What the instrument says. What the instrument says. Boy, this got really loud, Brian. It's just a moment ago. Did you crank it up? Oh, he leaned his computer against it. Don't do that, Mark. <laughs> exactly. It's where the needle is pointing to. That's your indicated airspeed. Uh, and it's very simply the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge says that's what the needle points to. It's the airspeed without correction for indicator, position, or compressibility, any of the other issues that can negatively affect the airspeed indicator. The next one on the list is calibrated. What's that? Corrected. It's corrected. Corrected for what? Instrument or, or position error. Typically, this is going to be caused by the angle that the pitot tube is mounted on the wing. And a lot of airplanes, I think we'll see one in a little bit here, there's a correction chart at various air speeds. The difference between indicated and calibrated is larger. Particularly if you're flying at a low air speed, the calibrated air speed will be higher than the indicated. And that difference gets bigger as you go slower because the airspeed indicator is now presented to the air at a, a higher angle. So less of it is going straight in. Exactly. So corrected for position or installation and instrument errors. And uh, so an interesting thing about this is some of those airspeed values that are in your POH for your airplane might be referenced to indicated airspeed or they might be indicated uh, referenced to calibrated airspeed. And you might need to know that. Uh, if you're going to make adjustments to things like, for instance, maneuvering speed, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Some airplanes, it's referenced and indicated, some and calibrated, and it might make a little difference. Equivalent airspeed. Anybody want to guess what that one is? Otherwise, I'll call on Ron. I know Ron knows equivalent airspeed. No? This one is not often used, especially in our little airplanes. It's, it's mostly used for high speed or high altitude type of airplanes. And here's the definition. It's the airspeed, if you were flying at sea level, it's the airspeed that you would get if you were flying at that same airspeed at altitude. So because we're dealing with a, a difference in the density of the air, it compresses differently at sea level than it does at altitude. And so at our speeds and altitudes, there's not much of a difference. A structural speed as well. So um, when we're talking about the, the load limiting type speeds at the corners of your VN diagram, that's where equivalent airspeed is used. And at our little planes at low altitudes, it's not much of a big deal. But at sea level, it, they're the same. Equivalent airspeed and calibrated airspeed would be the same. So as you go higher and faster, calibrated airspeed becomes higher than it should be, and we have to make an adjustment. And that's what all the engineers do when they're designing our airplanes. And the final one is true airspeed. What's this one? Corrected for pressure and temperature. Or another way to look at it is this is the actual speed of the aircraft moving through the air. So if you could measure the speed of the molecules of air going by your wing, this is what you would see. And because we can't measure that directly, we take the other airspeeds and, and adjust based on temperature and altitude to get what the true airspeed would be if we could measure it. In a standard atmosphere at sea level, and if it's warmer or a different pressure gradient that day. If we're in a high pressure area, it'll be different than low pressure and so forth. So a clever way to remember this is if you remember that iced tea is a pretty cool drink, you start with indicated, you adjust for position, you get calibrated, you adjust that for compression, you get equivalent, you adjust that for density, and you get true. So I-C-E-T is a pretty cool drink. Very clever. I'm a genius, aren't I? OK, so we got a bunch of V-speeds. You've all heard about various V-speeds. Different kinds of aircraft have different kinds of V-speeds. We're going to go through each and every one of these in excruciating detail. And we'll be here for a, maybe we'll get done by the time the air show starts, uh, the night air show. But no, we're going to go through the purple ones here. Uh, I kind of probably did that backwards. I should have dimmed the others. But these are ones I want to spend a little bit of extra time on because most of us are airplane pilots, little airplane pilots. And these are the ones that we deal with on a fairly regular basis. So back to our airspeed indicator. And if we look at these markings that are on there, the, some of those colors mean various things. So VSO, for instance, is a stall speed in the landing configuration. So when you look up that number in your pilot operating handbook, this is going to be gear and flaps down. 
The next one is VS1. Anybody want to hazard a guess about what this one is? Clean. It's actually in a specified configuration, whatever the manufacturer chose to put. Typically, they'll put clean, but it's not necessarily. You have to see how they defined it in the manual for you. VFE, <laughs> flap extended speed. This is one I see a lot of pilots putting their flaps down right at VFE as you're decelerating for landing. Uh, one of my friends at my home airport, he runs a flying club there. It's a 182, just like mine. A couple years ago, he had to replace the aft spar in the airplane because it was tweaked by people extending the flaps too fast. So this is not the speed at which you can put flaps down. This is the maximum speed at which flaps can be put down. I would submit, especially if you're an airplane owner and it's coming out of your pocket, you might want to give that a little leeway. You don't need to stress this any more than you need to. For full flaps, typically, yes. Some airplanes, like a 152, they only list one speed. In my 182, I can put the approach flaps down at 140 knots and then 95 knots for beyond approach flaps. So know your airplane. It should be on a placard right next to the control and or the indicator. Uh, in my 182, and if you were flying at the Pilot Proficiency Center, that 172, the first notch of flaps is coated blue, light blue on the indicator. That's 110 knots in that simulator and in a 172 and 95 in the, uh, in, for the more than approach flaps. VNO. Normal operating, yeah. Can we go a little farther than that? It's also got a big, big word name here, maximum structural cruising speed. If it's smooth, you can fly as, up to that speed. If it's rough, you really want to be slower than that speed. Uh, bad things may happen if it's turbulent and you're flying above VNO. Ron, that's Paul just got here. <laughs> VNE, never exceed, yeah. It's a red line, and what do we know about red lines in your airplane? Structural limit speed, yeah, kind of. Um, the way I phrase it is at VNO, that's the top of the green arc or the bottom of the yellow arc. Bad things may happen if you're in there. If you're over VNE, bad things will happen. Don't go there. Uh, it's just not a happy place to be. And we'll talk a little bit more on VNE later on. So here's how they're marked. You see each color transition, the beginning or end of the, the colored arc, is one of these speeds. So these are the speeds that are uh, depicted on the uh, indicator. We'll go through them. We talked about them quickly here. We got stall speed landing configuration. Um, yeah, we just talked about all that. Bottom of the green arc is in a specified configuration, most often power off. So. Here's a poser for you. Those of you, if you're a licensed pilot, how many student pilots in the room? I'm always a student. I, all of your hands should be up. Great, awesome, welcome. So you're probably starting to study these. Does an airplane always stall at VS? No. Airplane can stall when? Bank angle. Any bank angle, any pitch attitude. Uh, any airspeed, it's really variable, mostly based on wing loading. Maybe a few other things along the way. So why not? And, and the question is, how do you know when the stall, when the, the wing will stall? When will it always stall? What's the common denominator? We got everybody at once. When it, the critical angle of attack is exceeded. So we don't know what airspeed that is, but typically at 1G, it's about the bottom of that arc. And you may have, under the old PTS, you may have flown around in stall speed, uh, in slow flight, with your airspeed indicator below the green arc. I do that all, all day long. I'm below the stall speed, but I'm still flying. Why is that? Weight's not maximum. That might be a factor. Another factor is my engine's running. It's blowing wind over the wings, so that's giving me some, some lift, increasing some airspeed over the wing in that portion of the wing. There's a whole host of other reasons it might do that. Um, let's talk again a little bit about VFE, max flap extended. Max flap extended, you corrected me on that one. Thank you very much. Um, high speed permissible with the flaps extended. Again, don't push that. It's, it's your wallet. 
And we're starting to run out of wings in our airplanes, so the more wings that you damage with this stuff, the less wings we have to fly our airplanes. Can cause stress wear damage. That's a very expensive repair on that 182. They were looking at north of $25,000 to replace those aft spars. So if you've got a wet wing airplane, that's often the trailing edge of the fuel tank in your airplane. If you do this a lot, you can crack your fuel tank uh, seals. That another expensive thing. So if you're seeing fuel leaking in a wet wing airplane, maybe somebody's done that and it's time to take a close look at that spar. So VNO, we talked about that. It's the normal operating speed, top of the green arc. Um, normal operation or maximum structural cruising speed. If you look at the, that VN diagram, there's a, as the stall speed at G increases, it's, it's right up in a, one of those corners in the upper, uh, upper notch of that diagram. That's beyond the scope of what we'll talk about here. But you can exceed, if you exceed the limit load factor above this speed, you can cause damage to the airplane. So this is why that's an important speed to know. That's why it's marked on there. Permanent deformation of the structure doesn't sound good to me. That's, I think that's a bad thing. So if we extend this out a little bit more, we get off to the top of the yellow arc, we get to the red line, we've decided that's the never exceed speed. Speed which should never be exceeded. That's pretty simple. I don't know about you, but I'm not a test pilot. I'm not interested in playing around in that, that part of the envelope. I don't get paid enough for that. Um, bad things will happen. So don't go there. There's dragons there. So I want to explore this just a little bit, though, because V and E is marked, but does it ever change? Really? And the thing about V and E is it's, it's based on true airspeed. It's based on the velocity of the molecules across the structure, which we can't read directly, right? Um, so it does sort of change a little bit, and it changes because of the density of the atmosphere we're flying through and all this pressure and temperature business. Um, and I, I looked into this just a little bit. Um, this has to do, one of the major components of this is aircraft, is aircraft component flutter. And this, this is going to get into a lot of stuff. That I'm a college dropout. I'm completely unqualified to be in the seat I'm in. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an aerodynamicist. I don't even play one on TV. But this is just interesting to me. Um, and these, this flutter, it, it's kind of like radio antennas and stuff. That's voodoo magic to me. I don't quite understand it. But if you have insufficient atmosphere there to dampen the motion of a portion of your wing structure or, or any part of the airplane, it will start to flutter and there's not enough air there to dampen that. As you go up higher, there's less and less air, so it will start to flutter at a lower speed. And that's a lower true air speed. So I looked into this a while back. Um, so it's not the pressure that affects that flutter so much as it is the actual speed across the structure. Uh, there's less air there that act as a damper. And um, there was a, a story a while back, this is probably almost 15 years ago now, there was a, a Navy test pilot who built an RV and he, he wanted to go fast, so he put a bigger engine in this thing. And he found when he'd be flying at, say, 12,000 feet, that every now and again in cruise, he'd feel a little vibration in the airframe. And he started looking into it and thought, I better do a little math on this and figure out what's going on. So he came up with a, a chart that looks about like this, and I blanked out some portions, and we're going to talk about this. In his flight testing program, he determined that when he got up to 230 knots indicated at sea level, that's when the flutter would start. So you back off of that speed, you get your VNE speed, and he could, in this airplane, indicate 206 knots at sea level. And so the difference between this 230 knot flutter speed and the 206 knot indicated is a 23 knot margin. It's about 10%. So now he took this airplane up 4,000 feet with his turbocharged engine that still makes the same amount of power at altitude as it makes at sea level. And now he can go faster. So now his true airspeed, this is where the uh, turbocharged airplane really shines. Uh, this thing is just not wanting to play with me today. His true airspeed is 214 now. His indicated airspeed has, has reduced a little bit because the atmosphere is thinner. So now, he's, if he's just looking at the indicated airspeed versus that flutter, now it looks to him like he's got a 27.9 knot difference. So it looks like it's getting better, right? So he goes up to... To 8,000 feet, even better. His, his airspeed comes down a little bit more. 
flutter margin increases. He's thinking he's fat, dumb, and happy, and this is great. He gets up there at 12,000 feet. He's only indicated 193, and it looks like he's got a 36-some knot difference. Uh, his true airspeed is going up because his engine's making the same power and the air is less dense, he can go faster, and so on, up to 16 and 20 and, and so forth. So at 24,000, it looks like he's got almost a 50-knot flutter there. The problem is this middle box. Because we determined that the margin is based on, or the, the flutter speed is based on your true airspeed, that margin is actually getting smaller. So right up here at about 12,000 feet, He's crossed over that zone where his, his true airspeed is above that flutter speed, and he's getting flutter in the, the airplane. So it's not always better to hang a bigger engine on your airplane. Maybe you want a bigger airplane if you're going to put a bigger engine on it. So I just thought that was really interesting when I discovered this thing. I had no idea. So we got a bunch of airspeeds that are not depicted on the airspeed indicator that we might want to be involved with. You might want to be, have some familiarity with them. If you're a diligent pilot and you're planning your flight, your, your takeoff appropriately, you're going to consider during your takeoff run, do I have obstacles I need to cross? Do I need to use VX? Or am I going to go straight to VY after takeoff? Um, if I'm uh, going to be maneuvering a little bit, maybe I want to know about maneuvering speed, so I respect those limits at the weight of the airplane. Uh, best glide speed, uh, VLO, VLE. Most airspeed indicators, these are not marked on the airspeed indicator, but if you fly a retractable gear airplane, you probably want to know where those are. If you fly a Mooney with a Johnson bar landing gear, if you're going too fast, it's really hard to get the gear up. Because um, I can't do it with, if I'm left-handed. I, I usually sit right seat in the Mooney, and my left arm is really weak. And if I'm over about 95 knots, I can't get the gear up. And I, I fly with Jolie Lucas quite a lot. She's got a Johnson bar landing gear uh, E-model Mooney. I know after takeoff, I just get out of the way because she takes that and goes boom and the gear's up. And I, I got a couple of nice bruises on my left arm before I figured that out. Uh, and landing uh, reference speed, we don't use that much in little airplanes. Brian and I fly the jets with a reference speed that's based on mostly weight but a few other parameters as well. We're not going to talk a whole lot about that, but I did want to spend some time on VX and VY because this is some, some critical things. We have any people who fly in the mountains at all? we have taken a mountain flying course. There's some interesting things about this that were, were pretty cool to me. VX is your best angle of climb speed. This is the speed that will get you the, high, the most altitude gain in the shortest horizontal distance. So if you're sitting on a runway, getting ready to take off, and there's trees over there, or cumulo granite, a mountain over there, you want to get the most altitude you can before you get there. You're not so concerned about time, but you're in interested in the distance. So that's when you would use VX. And all of us probably remember it's VX because an X has more angles in it than a Y, so it's best angle of climb. That's how I remember. Um, we're going to use this in a short field, obstructed field, to get over obstacles. The problem with VX is it's slower than VY. It's often quite slow. And if you have a problem with your engine at that phase of flight, it's really important to get the nose down right now to maintain your airspeed before you hit the ground. Brian does a talk on that. It's got a really interesting video he uses for that one. So if you're flying in the mountains, you need to know that your VX speed in the mountains is higher than it is at sea level. And you can see this if you look in the performance charts for your airplane and you go look at, say, a 5,000-foot field elevation and you look over in the left-hand side there, and at that elevation, it's going to show you what your climb speed is. And they're talking about VX, and that number is a little bit faster at higher elevation. So if you're using the same speed in the mountains that you normally use at sea level, you're not getting all the performance out of your airplane. Density altitude, yeah, and it's affected by temperature and elevation and all that, yes. So, the next one is VY. What's that? I got the answer right there. It's an open book test. You got this. Trust me. So, this is the most altitude gained in the shortest period of time. So, if you consider that altitude is your friend, after takeoff, you want to get to the highest altitude in the shortest period of time right after takeoff because... Time is options. Time is money in the bank, as Bob Hoover used to say. It's money in the bank. Money in the bank. I got margin. So 
uh, we'll talk about the process in a little bit, but once you're clear of all your obstacles, the way I climb my airplane is VY to 1,000 feet, so I get the most altitude I can in the shortest time, and then I can transition to a cruise climb configuration. Interestingly, if you're in the mountains, VY decreases with altitude. So again, if you use the same best rate of climb airspeed in the mountains that you used at, this, at sea level, you're not getting all the performance out of the airplane that you could or that you probably need. And again, if you look at those charts there, the, the time, speed, and distance to climb charts, let's say, in a, a Cessna airplane, at the higher altitudes, it shows a slower speed for your climb speed. So it's all in those charts. It's just not really pointed out as such. And for this exploration, I, I got a, a bunch of diagrams I got from my friend Rod Machado. I've been trying to duplicate these so I could do them myself, and I, he's a smarter man than I. I haven't figured it out. So this top graph here is your rate of climb. So if you fly the speed on the bottom and follow that up to this top graph, that's the rate of climb that you'll attain with that airplane. Pretty simple, right? The top of that is the best rate of climb. Any other airspeed you fly, you will climb more slowly than you did at that VY speed. So the arc falls off on both directions. So that's pretty simple too. VX was always curious to me. I never really understood how VX was determined. And I don't know if this is an engineering thing or what, but they draw a line from zero over here, and they lean it up against this graph, and where that line meets, that's your VX speed. So I'm not smart enough to understand why that works, but I can understand a picture, and that's where it is. And now if we take these same graphs and we, we draw this graph at a different altitude, we'll get a different graph. I fly a normally aspirated airplane, so I'm not going to climb as much. If I'm at 5,000 feet, I might only get 550-some feet a minute right here where I could get almost 800 feet a minute there. So 5,000 feet higher, I'm not climbing as much. If you're really sharp and you look at this, you may also notice that your VY came over here a little bit, your VX came over here. We'll look at that in just a second. And at higher altitudes, the line is even lower. So it's part of why you can't climb as much when you get to altitude. It's for a host of reasons, engine, propeller, wing, temperature, bunch of stuff. So any questions on that? Is that clear? how this is figured out? It's, you know, I see a quizzical look there, and that's the same look I had when I first saw this diagram, and, oh, that's it. All right, so now, if we take these at different altitudes and we draw that line from the origin and lean it against tangent to each of these graphs, you can see as we go to a higher altitude, VY is coming up a little bit, and VX is coming up quite a bit more. And the cool thing is, we'll look at it in just a second, we'll graph those out and watch what happens. But what you should notice about this is as we get higher, these two speeds are getting closer together. That's significant. We're going to look at that in just a second. So you plot them out a little bit better there. This is now a true airspeed graph. It was indicated, I think, in the last one. So we plot those lines, and you're starting to see now we're connecting the dots and how these are working. Eventually, you get to an altitude where these lines meet up. Now, what do you think happens when we get to that point? So we've got our best rate of climb here. We've got our best angle of climb there. They're, they're crawling up there as we gain an altitude. And where they meet, and we, we convert this now back to indicated airspeed. What you're seeing, well, all those other graphs were true airspeed. Now we're going back to what you can see on your airspeed indicator. So now we're in indicated airspeed. We see the VY going down, VX going up. You still with me? Is this making sense? Now we'll summarize these differences. VX on the left, VY on the right. Climb per distance, climb per time. VX slower, VY faster. VX increases with altitude, VY decreases with altitude. So what happens when they meet? What's that called? Crickets. Almost. This is out of the, the airplane flying handbook, I think. We, they graphed them out there. Where they meet is the absolute ceiling. The airplane cannot go any higher. If you go faster or slower, the airplane will descend. You, that's, that's it. That's all she wrote. Service ceiling is when the airplane can maintain a 100 foot a minute positive rate of climb. That's, we always hear about service ceiling, but that's 
the definition, there's an absolute ceiling that's just a little bit above it. So this is going to lead us into a recommended climb profile. This is the way I climb my airplane, and I suggest I would submit that you might explore this for your airplane. You're taking off from a runway. If you have obstacles on this runway, when you get off the ground, use VX to get over those obstacles. Once you're clear of all the obstacles, accelerate to VY. Fly at VY until you're 1,000 feet. I don't, we should also mention if you fly a retractable gear airplane, don't retract your gear in this portion of it yet. Some aircraft, depending on the aircraft, you could get a big increase in drag as doors open up and this whole process occurs. So you don't want that in that first segment of the climb. Wait until you get over the obstacles. Now you can bring the gear up, accelerate to VY, fly that to 1,000 feet. Once you get to 1,000 feet, I cruise climb my airplane at 500 feet a minute at full throttle. That gets the nose down, gets better cooling through the engine, gets better visibility. You're trying to get to point B, so you're getting more distance down range. That's a good thing. Now, I climb at that airspeed. If I'm fairly light in my 182, depending on the temperature, I'm usually indicating about 110, 115 knots. Coming out here, I had two other people in a baggage area full of, of stuff. I could only get about 95 knots. It was fairly warm. And I just fly that 500 feet a minute until this airspeed has de decreased down to best rate of climb airspeed. Now, I can't hold 500 feet a minute anymore. I'm doing all I can, but I'm going to use VY until my airspeed decreases down to the VX airspeed. And at that point, I'm done. I'm, I, that's all I can do. So that's the climb profile I use. And uh, think about this in your airplane. And I can't tell you how many times I've flown with somebody and I talk about this climb profile. Uh, Bonanza pilots seem to be the worst at it. Sorry, all you Bonanza pilots. They break ground, and instantly they're at 130 knots. And they're climbing out real flat. And I think you, you look at some of these videos about the turn back maneuver, there's been a lot of experimentation on that. That climb gradient is shallower than your descent gradient without an engine. There is no way you can even contemplate making the, the turn back to the airport. And this is really dived in in depth in some work that Brian Schiff has done and, and Russ Still and some others. So it's worth exploring and worth thinking about. So uh, here's another look at that effective altitude on VX. Um, then I have this. So if you depart a high elevation airport, so we're not up in this portion of the graph up here. We're, we're way down here. Um, the point I wanted to make here is that we lose about one airplane a year. I fly out around Southern California. And we have a local mountain airport called Big Bear. Great place to go. Nice little restaurant there. We lose about one airplane a year there that doesn't make the, the climb out due to the density altitude. I think they're probably using the VX or VY speed from sea level in the mountains. They're not using the proper speed. I think that's what's going on. I'd be interested to see the reports and study that a bit. So when you've got a takeoff performance chart that gives you a climb speed at altitude, use that speed. Don't use the same one you use at sea level. So let's talk a little bit about maneuvering speed. This, this uh, had a little change in heart a, lot, a couple of years ago. Um, this one's not marked on your airspeed indicator. It's called VA. And this is where the engineers in the room will probably have me for lunch. Um, this is the maximum speed at which you can deflect a control one time in one direction and not overstress the airplane. Another way to think of it is the wing will stall before it can exceed the, the uh, load factor. So it's, if you're faster than that, you start getting in turbulence where you could get a gust that would overstress the airplane, slow down below the speed. Before the airplane breaks, the wing will stall, and that will naturally de-stress the airframe, and you'll, you'll live to tell the story. So, um, and there we are. So the published maneuvering speed in your book is at your airplane's max certificated gross weight. So if you are flying lighter than that, your maneuvering speed is lower. So if you're lighter, you think about it this way. The gust can move your airplane more easily. You can get to that structural load limit at a lower speed, so you want to reduce the speed. How much? I've never seen it published in a book. But it turns out, uh, yeah, there will be a little bit of math. We take the actual weight uh, today versus the max certificated weight. We divide those two, take the square root of that, multiply that by the 
original VA, and that gives you the speed. And here's how that works. My 182 at 29.50 is my max gross takeoff weight in the original, uh, and it's 111 knots. Let's say I weigh 2,700 pounds today. I put that into the formula, and it spits out 106. So it's about five knots less over a 250-pound weight difference, so one knot per 50 pounds. Works out pretty close. Another rule of thumb, oh, did you want a picture of that, Andre? So that's the, if you got a calculator and you're in the heat of battle, want to whip that thing out and do the math and figure it out, you can do that. Or you can use a, uh, hello. I see the mouse moving around there. Okay, here we go. Rule of thumb, it's about, um, if you're 10% below the max gross weight, the, the maneuvering speed will be reduced by 5%. And if you do that math, it's a little bit easier, you get the same number. How about best glide speed? Your airplane has one best glide speed, right? And what does that best glide speed do for you? She says, takes it to farther dis farthest distance from your, the engine failure point. Most time. Okay, these are a little bit different, actually. It's best lift over D, farthest distance available, not necessarily time. Any glider pilots in the room? I've done a little glider flying. I love it. I didn't finish. I don't have my certificate. Um, but it's the speed for best lift over drag, farthest distance with a, in a no-wind, no-power situation. Glider pilots will know this as the best lift over drag speed. This is different than the most time. And let's look at, I think they call it a polar graph, and you'll please help me through that if I get it wrong. It's the lowest ratio of sink rate to airspeed. Any change in speed will decrease the glide distance capability. So if you're on final, for instance, you're one of those people who likes to try to stretch your glide, you want to slow down a little bit and stretch your glide, that's not going to do it. You cannot stretch your glide. Yeah, there's some interesting things about that happened on my first solo flight in a glider. This is different than the minimum sink speed. And if you think about these kind of in the, the same sort of relationship that we looked at VX and VY, one had to do with distance, VX had to do with distance, VY had to do with time. Minimum sink and best glide is kind of the same thing. So this is a polar chart, is that what this is? So this is our descent, airspeed's over here, rate of sinks over here, where the top of this arc is, that's your V minimum sink speed. That's the lowest negative number you'll see on your vertical speed indicator. And in the same way we determine VX and we lean that line from the origin against the tangent, this is going to bring in the distance into the, the calculation. So our best glide speed is a little bit faster. Does that make sense? So if you lose an engine and you're right next to an airport, I don't care much about my my distance. I don't need distance. I got an airport right there. But maybe I want some time to hang around and figure out what's going on with the engine. Maybe I can restart the engine. But if I'm cruising along and I lose the engine and I don't have an airport right below me and I'm looking at something out on the distance, that's where you want your best glide speed. And the problem is it changes based on wind. And if we look at the next version of this, if you think about, if you're flying into a headwind, that's giving you a penalty. And if it's, you're getting a penalty, you'd like to get that penalty for as little time as you can, so you want to go faster. And conversely, if I'm in a tailwind, I'd like to take advantage of that so I can go farther. If you slow down in a tailwind, it'll affect you for a longer period of time. So out of the headwind faster, stay in a tailwind longer. Roughly speaking, if you add half the headwind, if you know that I'm flying into a 20-knot headwind, if I speed up by 10 knots, that that'll, is about the most effective best glide I can do, and conversely with a tailwind. And that looks like this. If we basically move the origin here from zero, and we're flying into a headwind, we come over here, that's our new origin, we lean that against the graph, we see the line up there, and it's to the right of the no wind best glide speed, conversely with a tailwind. And then gliders will also, if they happen to know that they're in rising or sinking lift, they'll also adjust it vertically along that graph. So if you're, if you're dealing with mountain wave and you're sinking, I mean, myself included, that happens to me. I want to slow down and try to maintain altitude. You're giving yourself a penalty. You're flying into that sinking air for longer. And if you ask ATC for a block altitude, you can just speed up and get out of it quicker and get into the rising air that's almost inevitably just ahead of it. 
Did I get that right? Cool. Uh, this, this one. All right. So let's talk about some ways that the indicator, airspeed indicator failures, uh, fails. How, who's had an airspeed indicator failure? Wow, okay, four or five of us. Um, and I'm not talking about in the simulator when they, I, I was all done with my 787 check ride and the guy said, oh, well, we got the sim for another hour. What do you want to see? And I said, show me something. So I take off out of Newark and he instantly speeds the airspeed indicator and it's cheating in the 787. We, we have one that'll virtually calculate it based on angle of attack. And it's, it's just like nothing ever happened. But start with that drawing. Keep that drawing in mind, static connected to the, uh, the three, all three instruments, pitot connected to the airspeed, and two static ports. So I'm not going to make you read this whole thing. The bottom line is the guy took off and the airspeed indicator is acting weird. He, it's not accelerating. He's got his power set. He's got his pitch set. What's going on? Brian sent me this great picture. It's sitting there with the airspeed indicator on it, the, the uh, cover on there. And the problem is, depending on the type of cover, if it's got a tight seal, you'll have that pitot pressure is locked in there and it can't change. One like this, depending on all sorts of things, you could have a vacuum created in there. And so you get a bigger difference. It, there's all sorts of things that could happen. It's, um, yeah, it was a bad day. Uh, there's another one here. This one happened out of Santa Monica a few years ago. This was a student pilot on a solo cross-country trip, I think. Airspeed indicator failed right after takeoff, and he ended up, uh, he just tried to go around, tower directed to go around. He went around, but he flew into the trees because he's trying to fly airspeed, and doesn't know the pitch plus power equals performance thing, and ended up in the trees. So it was filled with debris. Uh, insects had built a nest in there. Maybe it moved around. Maybe he didn't see it on the pre-flight, but it moved around into a place that it, it did get him. Uh, we all know about Air France. What happened there? This was faulty. All three airspeed and, and pitot, or, uh, pitot and uh, static pressure sensors were faulty. The heaters were faulty. They were flying in a thunderstorm. They all iced up. I've flown this scenario in the simulator. Brian probably has too. And the problem is they got simultaneous overspeed and underspeed warnings. So you got the overspeed clacker going off, you got the stall warning going off. What do you do with that? It's hard to figure out. But the answer is you fly pitch and power, known values, and that'll probably last long enough that you can recover the airplane. Um, okay, this one, again, the airspeed's all over the place. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one, but the bottom line is... Uh, they had taped over the static ports to wash the airplane. How many of you have done that? Nobody's going to admit it. If you put tape over the static port, leave a great big long tail on it so you can see it. If you put just a little dab on the static port itself, you probably won't see it. And you may leave it there. Uh, I forget the airline, but there was a 757 lost somewhere in South America. I think they did that. Um, so, also, if you put the tape on it, make sure you take it off. Don't rely on somebody else to take it off. Do it yourself. Uh, student pilot didn't see it. So, if you're teaching students how to do pre-flight inspections, make sure you point these out. It's not just a pretty little dot on the side of the airplane. It serves a vital purpose. And he also did not activate the alternate static source. And we'll talk on that in a little bit. Uh, so here's another one. He got his clearance. Uh, he did, w gusty winds. He decided to take the other one. He, halfway through his takeoff, right before rotation, airspeed's at zero. If you've done, uh, anybody done the Pilot Proficiency Center program over there, the simulators? Yeah, I've been teaching over there all week. We've got a couple scenarios that talk about this. Determine what airspeed you need to see by what point on the runway. If you don't have it, abort the takeoff. So he's rotating and he doesn't have airspeed and that's when he discovers it. And it's a snow-covered runway doesn't have time or space to stop. So make that decision early and, uh, and, and commit to it. Um, you see that one, there's a little bit of ice on the wing's leading edge. That didn't help. Uh, but the static ports looked clear. It probably got broken free in the, in the accident sequence. And he also did not use the alternate static source. I figured I could use it once I was up high enough to clear the trees. If you think you need it, do it now. Don't wait. Or even better yet, reject the takeoff and stop. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go past that one here. 
Here was an interesting one. I think there's water in the port there. You have little water separators probably on either side of your airplane where the static port comes into the airplane. When you do your static transponder inspection, you're supposed to check those. Make sure there's no water in them. Uh, this one, this actually happened to me. I used to fly a 340, which is a pressurized twin. We'd had some work done on the altimeter, I think, or maybe the transponder. I took it off on a test flight. Day VFR only, please, for your test flights. Uh, there was another accident. Somebody took off. The same, same problem I had, but he was in day IMC. Took off into the clouds without an airspeed indicator. Airspeed showed zero. Altimeter showed field elevation. What happened here? Airspeed started decreasing. I'm flying what should be a good pitch and a good power setting, but I got, you know, airspeed, altimeter, everything's wrong. What happened? Static lines disconnected inside the cabin. It's a pressurized airplane, so instead of measuring outside static, it's measuring inside static. So please don't do your test flights on IMC or at night. <laughs> Alternate static in that case didn't help because it just opened the whole system up. When I depressurize the airplane, now I'm getting more like external ambient pressure and it's working much better. Um, yep, okay, and I'll skip that one. So that's your static port. Know your alternate static selector. Know where that is in your airplane and try it sometime. Um, make sure you turn off the autopilot first. But sometime pull that alternate static and watch what happens on the instrument so you know. Uh, I fly a Cessna and I've got an airspeed calibration chart. If I'm using alternate static at this speed, this configuration, that's the difference I'm going to have. So if you don't have a, an alternate static source, what do you do? And the typical answer is to break your vertical speed indicator. Uh, the problem is there's still a, uh, there's a calibrated leak that's a, a part of this system. Uh, come on. And play with me. So there's going to be a lag in that into the rest of the static system. So it may or may not work. Be aware and try it. Well, I mean, don't smash your vertical speed indicator. Those things are expensive. So if you have a single static port versus a dual static port, and if you can see the little red line there, you've got a static port on one side, it's coming in. If you're flying in a slip one direction or the other, you're either getting negative pressure or positive pressure in there. And you're going to get a difference on your altimeter and all these other instruments. So if you've got dual static ports, then this problem equalizes from side to side, and it's much less of a problem. So if you can, get an airplane with two static ports. So you should know pitch plus power equals performance. If you're an instrument pilot or instrument student, you're learning this. The first thing you do is establish what power setting gives you what airspeeds and which configurations. And you figure out a few of these that you're going to use for your, your regular flying. Here's the chart for the 737. You know, we routinely fly a failed airspeed indicator. And if I weigh 140,000 pounds, I'm on approach with flaps 30. Uh, I'm going to set my pitch attitude at one degree, and I'm going to set my N1s, my RPM, basically at 58%. So we know these, and we practice these, and you can fly an approach like that if you know what these numbers are. So do this ahead of time. Um, so if you lose one of these, especially if you're IFR, you lose your airspeed indicator. In my opinion, that's an emergency. If I'm IFR or at night and I lose my airspeed, I'm going to declare an emergency. Um, Select the alternate static source if you have one. If you don't, consider breaking your vertical speed indicator and fly these pitch power settings that I was talking about that you uh, already determined. And if you can, find some good weather to get to. Let's see. So that kind of wraps it up here. That's why we have it, how it works, what it's saying, how it breaks. That's my email address if you want to fling me an email.